We are about to get into the uh, subject of, uh, I'm just go deep diving on this one, so to speak, here. Um, and it turns out that there is a local connection to this group that went exploring the Titanic, the wreckage of the Titanic, 13,000 feet plus uh, beneath the ocean surface. And Maria, can you explain the local connection to it? Um, so Hamish Harding, Hamish Harding um, actually owned the Sino Swearingen building for a period of time, um, and the airport authority was working with him, talking with him um, to um, to talk about you know the purchase of that building, and um, you know he um, was a very uh, very interesting guy, very well versed in a lot of things, in a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's just hard to believe. Um, anyway, uh, uh, yeah, and Bill has certainly more insight about what may or may not happen here within the next few hours. Especially our guest, which... Craig okay. McLean is uh, NOAA's retired chief scientist and head of Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research. And you're a good friend, right? Very yes. friend, yes. Yes. Craig, good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having me. Good morning. You're on with Rob and Marie and, of course, Bill. Uh, set this scenario for us, Bill and Craig, as to what uh, the possibilities of uh, survival would be here, what uh, this group might be facing if they're... Uh, still alive beneath the ocean surface, and uh, what this specific mission that they were on was. Bill, you want to go first? I was going to ask Craig go ahead and go. Okay. All right, well, thank you. First, I, I need to get the particulars out of the way. Admiral Stubblefield does have a first name as Bill, but he'll always be Admiral to me, so <laughs> forgive me in the way that I might <laughs> informally refer to him as, as Admiral. Uh, he has deep-sea submersible experience, as do I, and I'll start with just an overview of the Titanic situation. As you said, Rob, it's very deep in the water. It's two and a half miles deep. And for a community in your area of West Virginia, I think the circumstances that prevail for the families who are waiting for good news from the ocean community that's conducting the search is very similar to the experience that people in coal mining accidents might have, where folks are waiting on the surface for the detailed information of those very few who are immediately at the scene and very proximate to the scene of, of the, the, the pending disaster or hopeful rescue. So what we have here is time ticking down for the amount of air, oxygen enriched air that the occupants of this submersible might have. It's a very closed and confined space inside of that submersible or any submersible. And what drew them to this target is the fascination that we all have as a public with the story of the Titanic, the sinking of the Titanic, and the miraculous discovery with high-grade ocean technology to have found the Titanic back in 1985. Some of that technology extends into the future with refinements or the ability to make better tools, and that's what has enabled the opportunity for people to basically visit the Titanic in, in effectively a tourist-like manner to just go down, to look, to see it in the first hand. But as you know, it's a very expensive undertaking to get out there. And I think the newspapers and, and other broadcasts have covered some of the particulars there. But the difficulty we face right now is that ships have been searching, aircraft have been searching at the surface for this submersible. It would be a remarkably difficult target to find but both the Canadian Coast Guard and United States Coast Guard are very experienced at such searches. But it's a small 21-foot craft that really does not stand up above the surface of the water when it reaches the surface. It basically is level with the surface. So it would be a hard visual target to find. The Coast Guard has reported their high confidence in their ability that if it is at the surface, they would be able to see it and find it. More complicated is the presumption that the vehicle may still be underwater on the bottom. So the Coast Guard strategy is to, both Canadian and United States, is to continue to look both above the water and under the water. The underwater search portion gets very, very difficult because the tools available in order to conduct such work are often remote. They're not standing by at the ready to be deployed for such an activity. And the mobilization 
or, or getting this gear in motion has taken a few days. Right now, today, there is a French ship underway and a Canadian contract vessel that has United States equipment, so the news has reported, en route to the location. It will likely not arrive until roughly dinner time this evening. That would leave about another day of breathable air inside of the vessel if the, the people who are on board that vessel are still alive. Um, I am uh, reasonably well acquainted with two people who are on that trip, one who is in that submersible, and I would just guard my, my um, statements towards the notion that I would be speaking to the family of that one person who's in that submersible. He's a very experienced deep sea submersible operator himself, but um, we all know the risks when we undertake such activities as these, and there certainly is a high-risk situation here for these folks. There's a possibility they're still floating at the surface undetected. There's a possibility that they're on the bottom. Um, I think there's a low possibility that they would have made it to the Titanic and gotten caught and stuck in around the Titanic. Given that the communication was lost just an hour and 45 minutes into their dive, I would imagine that the protocol would have been to abort the dive, return to the surface, and then refit the, the equipment that might have failed. So if they're on the bottom, it would be a, a challenging detection, but one that still has to be pursued. I think you might have heard as well that late last night there were reports on the news of an earlier in the day finding that there was noise coming in the ocean detected by the aircraft that deploy listing devices into the ocean. This is technology that was built to find submarines, not the kinds that we're talking about, but military submarines that do not go anywhere near as deep as the Titanic is. But there was some, some tapping or banging described further described by the, the Coast Guard report that was reported in the news, not released by the Coast Guard, just picked up by, I think, Rolling Stone magazine and then CNN and others. But there were noises coming from the area that was roughly where the submersible was launched. So a lot of unknowns, friends, a lot that has yet to be determined. But it's a, it's a dramatic situation that, once again, I think is, is probably very similar to what the community of your listening area might be familiar with. Bill, you and I were talking before this segment about the challenges of uh, su submerging, basically, to those depths and the different levels you go through and what's required. Can you touch on some of those? Yeah, let me go first to the sound. As Craig well knows, uh, they have uh, density layers in the ocean, what they call so far zones, uh, and the 12,000, uh, 13,000 feet encompasses probably several of these very so far zones. You can get noise trapped within these uh, from uh, multiple sources, including surface ships, whatever the case may be, and they can travel hundreds of thousands of miles. Uh, so we cannot we cannot dismiss these other sounds uh, that happen in the area. They, they may come from 3,000 miles away, but they would be detected in that area. They could be detected any area that you within the so far zone. Uh, an, another point I think uh, we should make is there are, uh, and Craig alluded to it, and you mentioned it, Rob, uh, that these deep submersible diving are much, much, much deeper. They go much deeper than a regular submarine. Regular submarine, classified information, but I say probably two, three, four thousand feet. Uh, we're talking about here, uh, military submarine, we're talking about here a research vessel down to 13,000 feet. So, Different ball game altogether. They're up to this point in time, uh, probably six or seven of uh, these deep diving submersibles, and Craig's probably dove, on, dove in most of these, uh, but there's never been a single accident. Uh, there's a phenomenal safety precaution. Uh, and uh, so this is the first one that we've had with an accident. Uh, there's been some mishaps, but nothing that life's been threatened. But you put these two together. Uh, we have no vehicle. We have no way of going down to attaching to this deep submersible uh, and having the occupants move from one to the other. We see this in the movies with the submarines, but that's at much more shallow depth. At these depths, the only way you can rescue the people is to find the submersible first, hook onto it, and then pull it up. Pull it 
pull it up, pull it up. Exactly right. When you get in shallow water uh, with, without those extreme pressure, then you may be, be able to make the, the rescue operation. Uh, the summation of all this is uh, there's a uh, – the chances, we never want to give up until we have to give up, but the chances are if, if this sub submersible is not on the surface, chances of rescuing these people are fairly remote. And going back to the sound very quickly, if you may remember back with the Malaysia aircraft, uh, what, four or five years or so ago, they never found it, but they thought they were hearing sounds coming from it. Uh, and that quite possibly were sounds that were captured in this so-called so far zone. Okay, Craig, correct me where I'm wrong. No, no, Admiral, you've got it right, and um, it just is a rather grim outlook for the for the possibility here, both by timing and also just by the nature of the unreported communication link that has the, the uh, unreported presence of the submarine. There's been no communication with the sub, uh, submersible, and and that's very troubling as well. As I said, if if something went wrong during the course of the descent. I would be very confident that the pilot, who is actually reported to be the CEO of, of this company that takes these visitors out to the site, would have just dropped the weights. And apparently there are multiple ways to drop weights that counterbalance the uh, buoyancy that's built into such a, a vessel and drop the weights and commence to return to the surface. Excuse me, Craig. Let me explain that very quickly. Uh, because the limited power... These deep diving submersibles do not drive themselves to the bottom. Uh, they have weights, uh, and so enough weights to carry them to the bottom, and then they will cast off one half of the weights, and so your neutral buoyancy and the time they spent on the bottom, 12, 13,000 feet, they're at uh, neutral buoyancy, and then we get ready to come to the surface, they cast off or release the other weights, and they slowly drift back to the surface. So, so you alluded, Bill, to the fact that that you know that these types of expeditions have happened before, but there's never been an accident. So, what would what would prompt something this terrible to happen? I mean, I understand it's um, it's crazy deep, and um, and anything can happen, and. Obviously, some of the stuff that I've read said these folks are thrill seekers and they paid a lot of money to go on this particular expedition. But what would prompt it? If you know where the Titanic is, I'm being really making it very oversimplified here. But if you know where it is and you send the thing down, how do we lose track? Well, you don't. Let me let me give a couple of parameters. Okay. I want to come back to Craig to fill in. He's the real expert here. Okay. Uh, there's generally two danger parts uh, okay. when you when you go with deep submersible. Now, a lot most of the submersibles are not thrill seekers. Most of the submersible, the occupants are do, there to do science, to do okay. research. But not these folks. Well, I'm not going to dismiss one okay. way. I don't know. I have not talked to them. Uh, there are some. There's two or three of the occupants are very very credible uh, sure. deep water uh, researchers. So okay. they they're saying that they're, they're do research. Uh, the, uh, there's two danger points. Uh, one is what to go through the what we call the photic zone, where there's still some light penetrating through the ocean. Uh, the risk there are large fish coming in and seeing the light being attracted to it and attacking the submersible. Uh, you may laugh that off, except the, the weak point of any deep submersible are the viewing ports. And uh, most of it is a strengthened titanium hull, but the viewing ports are heavy, thick plexiglass, and a fish hitting just the right point could break that. So that's a that's a word, a word of caution. So they go through the photic zone in a darkened state, okay. uh, no lights at all. Once you get below the photic zone, then you can turn on some of the lights. The other risk is once you're on the bottom, especially in the case of the Titanic, uh, then you get caught in the rigging. And once you get caught in the rigging, there's hard to get out. Okay. Uh, there have been examples of much shallower uh, vessels being caught in rigging. Uh, but and Craig mentioned this. He did not think it got to the bottom because it's about a two and a half hour transit being pulled down with these weights till you get to the bottom, and they lost communication maybe an hour and a half into that. Okay, Craig, sorry, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Admiral. 
Yeah, this uh, this is an amazing site, Marie. When you when you start to think about the history that's under the water, a lot of people are drawn here for a the adventure, b the uniqueness of the experience. I think a lot has been written about the draw of the people who are have chosen to participate in this expedition. I've made three expeditions to the Titanic. In two of those um, involved deep diving submersibles, and the third one was with a remotely operated vehicle. In other words just a tethered or a long extension cord that brings power to the vehicle and imagery back up. The communication systems that allow the submersible to talk to the surface are usually redundant and many, which poses another problem as to why the submarine has not been heard from. But something else that's different here is that this particular submersible that was built by OceanGate is using very different material than the conventional materials of the deep diving community that both the Admiral and I have experienced in our, in our deep submergence. We were in a, a ball, a metallic hollow ball, a sphere, that is the pressure vessel. And the pressure there is applied equally at every point in that ball. This particular vessel was more of a conical device with a cap on it. The cap is the viewport and the remainder of the vessel tapers off, but it's built with carbon fiber rather than titanium or steel. The uniqueness of this material is one of the reasons why you, you see in the literature, you see in the news, that people are describing it as not having been an inspected or, or um, certified vessel by an inspection regime or agency like the American Bureau of Shipping or others. And it's just a unique material to be undertaking this activity. Not a lot of, of ground experience of how well that material stands up over time. So that's raised some speculation in the, in the science community and the deep submergence community as to what may have, have challenged this submersible in its, its descent. But um, there's, there's unclear evidence one way or the other. Bill, All we know is we haven't heard from them and time is ticking down. Bill and Craig, in, you mentioned the weak point being the window uh, uh, the port will build. By the, uh, so if a fish rams that and breaches the security, the, 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 the integrity of the hull, uh, what is the result of that? Is this a slow leak of water in? Is, is it a, a quicker problem? But tell me what the reaction is. Well, uh, first, I think Craig has uh, pointed out that uh, the, this Titan, the Ocean Gate, is not the conventional titanium hull with, with viewing points. But your question, I think, applies either way. If the hull is breached at those depths, it's going to be a catastrophic event. It's going to be very, very, very quick. It's going to be a total collapse of the, of the, um, uh, the structure uh, in in a very short period of time. If the hull is not breached, it happened to be subject to get to the bottom and no way to get up, then the temperature will probably get to you before anything else will because it's very cold down there, but, but the pressure is a big thing. If it's breached at all, it's going to be a catastrophic collapse. So this is not a this is not a slow drowning. I, I cannot imagine that either way. No, in, in no. that situation, no. I understand. Uh, you've been in, in an Alvin bill at a depth of twelve thousand something 12, feet. Twelve thousand six hundred. Yeah. And, and Craig, you've been to the floor with the Titanic. Uh, tell me, what does your body feel like in that situation in in one of these units? Well, first you're at one atmosphere. In other words, your body does not feel anything. Uh, it, you get eventually a little cold, uh, but not not painfully cold, but you're there, you're protected of one atmosphere. So you don't feel any pressure whatsoever? In None at all. None at all. Craig? Yeah, I, I, same thing, same experience. It's cramped. It's small. The spheres that I've been inside of, the Alvin, the Mir, uh, several other deep diving submersibles, you really can't stretch out the entirety of your body. If you do, you're displacing the two other people, because these are typically, for the, for the work that the Admiral and I have done, these are typically three-person submersibles. So uh, it's not a good day if you get a leg cramp. You really have limited maneuvering space. Um, you also have to handle all the biology of the body inside of that seven-foot diameter sphere. So people are very careful about what they choose to eat before <laughs> diving, the night before, the morning of. And um, there are modest relief capabilities there, but um, certainly there's no running water or fluid bathroom for anyone to benefit from. So it's a, it's a tight space. You, you have to 
like and enjoy the people that you're with because <laughs> uh, while these excursions for Ocean Gate only had roughly three hours scheduled to be on the bottom, plus the two hours plus down, three hours up, the uh, the science experiences that I think the Admiral and I have had, we're down for a fair bit longer than that. You're you're in that ball for a long time. It's not a place for claustrophobics, but you do bring winter styled jackets that are capable of resisting fire because fire is certainly your enemy inside of one of these submersibles, and there is oxygen enrichment in there. So uh, you bundle up because very few submersibles spend any energy on keeping the occupants warm, you keep that energy for communication and for propulsion. So um, it's not, I, I, I would say it's not the most comfortable place, but it is a thrill to be able to immerse oneself that deep in the ocean and see what is there, whether it's the Titanic or the marine life in other locations. But um, it's, it, it's a relatively enjoyable experience, I would say. Our listeners uh, raise a question about the hull thickness. Uh, it's my understanding uh, that the Titan, this Ocean Gate, uh, was using a combination of titanium and carbon fiber. Uh, and it, there was some uh, issue raised by one of the employees earlier. They they were un, they were uncertain if the carbon fibers, uh, how long that would withstand going up and down, pressure decompressing and the like, uh, and they speculated that the carbon fiber is not the whole thickness, but it's the makeup of the material that might become degraded over time. Have you heard that? Yes, yeah, so, um, I'm familiar with that concern, and um, that, that gets back to the issue of how many, how many cycles of compression, decompression, exposure, if you will, to deep dives the material has had, and can it be modeled by smaller devices, extrapolated into a large device? There's also the nature of what, what one would call through-hull or drilled through the hull, through-hull fittings, where any sensing from outside of the submersible that needs to get inside the submersible has to go through a penetration in that pressure hull. So as Bill and I dove in the Alvin or the other submersibles that, that we have dove in, there are multiple holes in that pressure hull that are very tightly fitted and don't allow any leaks to come back through. But it's, uh, it's quite surprising when you look at the stripped down hull and see how many violations of the hull or how many holes in the hull there are that are then plugged and capped with a wire that might be conducted through it. I don't know how many of those are, exist on, on the Ocean Gate submersible, but that's another consideration as to how well this material holds up in, in those through hole fittings. What, what, uh, Craig and Bill as well, what's the longest period of time that you've been in a submersible? In my case, about 14, 15 hours. Wow. Yeah. Craig, how about you? I, I, yeah, I was close to that. I think the longest dive that I had was 18 hours total. Ooh. Okay. Uh, we have, so uh, just, go ahead, Craig. Yeah, Marie, just consider a long airplane flight. You're not moving around much. Maybe you're watching a movie or reading a book that holds your attention. Here, you're not moving around much. Um, it's a long flight, but you have a high desire to be there. You also have a purpose to be there. The Titanic trips that I made were part of my job. And um, it goes much quicker than you would think. Okay. So yeah. I'll, I'll rest You're not there. watching but, the clock, but, in but, other words. But yeah. there's no bathroom facilities either. Yeah, yeah. You can't get up <laughs> we, and move we, around. We like have several all fair stories. Yeah, yeah. I can. I, spare me. <laughs> spare me, Bill. We will. <laughs> uh, Craig, I appreciate you uh, taking part in this uh, to further explain some of the situations that are going on right now with this submersible. Any final thoughts before we go to our top of the hour break? I, I just want to say that um, there are a lot of very dedicated people working as hard as they possibly can, and there's a mix of experience and disciplines here that range from at-sea search and survey to undersea search and survey, and uh, Bill will resonate with this. There, there's just a, a wonderful soul that he and I know both well. Uh, there's a chap named Scott McKellar down in South Carolina who used to work with us, and Bill, in my world, everybody involved in this search to try and save the lives of these people and find the vehicle. They're, they're, there's a fleet of Scott McKellars out there that work just so hard to do everything they can for the people who are deployed at sea. So we certainly wish them well, and we keep the families in our hearts and, and hope for the best outcome here. Thank you. 
Thanks, Craig. Thanks Thank for you. your insight and thanks for your experience. Uh, uh, Craig is in the network of this very, very close. As we were talking last night, he got was getting frequent updates on uh, where they were in the rescue. So, uh, uh, so Craig. Craig probably has more knowledge of the situation than anybody I know. Thanks for sharing with us, Craig. Thank you very much.